Okay. Welcome to Volunteer Leadership, Crafting Solutions and Inspiring Change with our special guest, Nicole R. Smith. What are we going to cover today? We're going to explore volunteer leadership by discussing the unique challenges of volunteer leaders and innovative solutions. We're going to explore current trends in volunteer donorship and what that could mean for your programming, plus some insights on pioneering new ways of viewing the value of volunteerism at your organization. And make sure to stay tuned to the end with us where we will discuss how to create space for innovation um, generating conversations around change and case making for volunteerism within your organization. So let's get started. AK. Yeah, so I'm excited about this today and we're really happy to have you, Nicole, and to kind of pick your brain. I feel like this is something that's definitely on the minds of volunteer leaders and nonprofits. Um, so what does it mean to you to change, to craft solutions and inspire change in volunteer leadership? It's a, it's a loaded question, but I feel like, <laughs> you know, there, there's some there's some tactics here uh, whenever we come to, to solve this. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much um, for having me as a guest. And thank you all to have all joined us. Like you guys could have been doing many other things with your hour, but you took time to come and listen to us today. So thank you so much. Um, so simply put, to me, like crafting solutions to uh, inspire change is thinking outside of the box to come up with solutions to the challenges that we have all the time. And not being like, oh, well, we can't get it done because of this. And we can't get it done because of that. Like, okay, what are some creative, out of the box, different ways that we can find a solution? Because I believe to my core where there's a will, there's a way. And just really diving into that. And um, and we can dive, you know, expand on that as we go through this whole thing. But it's being relentless about finding a solution, even when it seems like there is not one. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nicole. Tell us a little bit more just about your personal experience in um, in solution finding and maybe kind of reflecting on why you're so passionate about this belief that, you know, being relentlessly solution oriented. Well, because, so I believe in it relentlessly because otherwise we will, um, take, I guess, the the easy way out and like, oh, I just can't get it done. And the more we do that, the lesson we strengthen ourselves as leaders, the lesson we strengthen our voice, the lesson we strengthen our impact. And so looking at something in the face and be like, there's got to be a way to figure something out to have this type of solution. It, number one, it just, it builds your, um, your solution muscle, right? Like, and the more you practice it, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So, um, man, the solutions, um, uh, goodness, there's so many. Okay. One that I can think of right off the top is, and many of you may have had this experience, um, where, we have like a group of corporate um, volunteers who want to come in and they want to help, right? And it's that challenge of what can we do to find a solution to where there's a huge group of people who want to come and help the organization. But the way our organization is traditionally set up, how they want to help might actually cause more harm than helping. But I look at it as it's 200 people that want to help. So it took me, I, I sat back and I looked, I was like, is there something that we are missing? Is there something that we are overlooking that perhaps we could take advantage of people who, who, who want to give them their time, but their time is limited. And so we were able to marry a situation. One of the things that we um, used to do at a former organization of mine is we would wake up early in the morning and we would go um, running. And then, so we would work with people who were at risk of um, experiencing homelessness. And, but we were, we teamed up with um, a, like, like the Salvation Army. So they were in temporary housing. So we would get up in the morning and we were like, okay, come and run, jog with us in the mornings and develop new healthy habits. And so they would um, earn incentives. So we would track their mileage and then they would earn incentives. Well, we were having a challenge um, with having enough volunteers to come out at 
five thirty in the morning to give out incentives. Imagine that. Um, and so what we did was like, well, if we have all these people who want to help on a one-off capacity and we need the help in this particular section, let's see if we can marry the two. It worked out so much more beautiful than I expected. Oddly enough, that early start time was really great because it gave people enough time to come help and then still leave shower and get to work on time. So that was a, um, a solution. Um, people were able to walk along with um, our members. So it was a win-win for them as well because they could get their exercise in as well as encouraging people, as well as encouraging people. And what it did is it introduced them and it gave them that little, like, that little uh, like shot of energy that they needed towards like, we want to keep coming back and doing this. And it was a small door, but we were able to get them through the door. And then it was like, oh, what else can I do? What else, you know, um, can, where else can I help? Which was beautiful because now those person, those people who were really coming in with a one, a one-off, I only have this amount of time some of them eventually became recurring volunteers, which is what we need for our organization. Um, but it took some brainstorming. I had to, I sat with a couple of friends. I was like, what are we missing? There's surely there's something that we can do that will um that 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 will be a win-win for everybody. And it, it wasn't an easy solution. It didn't just come like we really had to sit and think and ponder. And then it just ended up working out so beautiful. The the corporation actually bought all of the materials that were going in the incentive bags. Um, so it just worked out so well, but had we had just been like, you know what, we, we just don't have anything for you. Sorry. We would have missed out on so many opportunities, not only them being able to experience the help um, our members benefiting from what was happening um, and the biggest thing for me was missing out on the opportunity to gain recurring volunteers who only wanted to come and volunteer for an hour. So that's just one example. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, some of the biggest, um, you know, challenges are really making that space for brainstorming and kind of seeing those unlikely solutions. So let's just dive into, you know, what are some of the common challenges? I know AK, you know, you're spending a lot of time with our volunteer leaders um, and we hear some of these, these things coming up regularly. So let's just chat about the real deal <laughs> is that we are facing challenges and, and it is, you know, challenging to kind of sit and make space for those solutions. Yeah, and I also, this is a good chance um, just to remind everybody of the chat. If there is a, a challenge in here that you're really resonating with or a story that you're thinking of, feel free to drop that there. Um, it's a really good space to kind of work together and kind of think through things. And we also want to see it. Because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of things on this list that I really resonate with, right? I mean, even in your regular life, but whenever you start to think about how you pull together things, I feel like time is just on the top of everybody's all the time, right? everybody's mind. So if time is something that is like really resonating with you as a challenge, feel free to let's drop a, a palm tree in the chat. So you can see, I, I think that this is something that is really common, um, but it's also something that, you know, we have to deal with. We're all facing time. Um, so how do we kind of still prioritize things that we know we need to do, but also leave that time for ourselves? So I, I love that that's the one that you jumped on um, because I think everything else kind of pulls from that and time, and we all know time is a commodity, right? Time is a commodity. Um, you only have but so much of it. And that's one of the biggest things like, yes, well, yeah, we can come up with these ideas and we can do this, and but I, I, we don't have time. Um, so one of the things that I like to challenge people to do is to take control of your calendar, right? Build it and block it out relentlessly. And sometimes it can be difficult to do, but setting those boundaries is only going to help you in so many ways. Um, some boundaries that I would set on my calendar um, because there was times that I needed to get things done or there was times that I was like, I needed to be able to brainstorm. So I would literally block it out on my calendar and it'd be like, I cannot have a meeting between these 
hours, you know, um, or hours, listen to me, hours, more like 30 minutes to an hour. Like, <laughs> let me not get crazy. Um, but I would block that time out and literally set it aside. And like, that is what I'm going to do at this particular time. Um, and then you're like, great, Nicole, that's, you know, and I've set that side a time and then a volunteer comes in with a huge problem and I, you know, and I have to give it up. Awesome. What I did for that is I started blocking out oops time, right? So if I wanted to, if I knew that I wanted to brainstorm for at least 30 minutes, I would put an hour on the calendar. I would build that time. So if some fire did come up and something did happen to come up and I was interrupted, I built in 30 minutes of time to accommodate for that. And then if nothing happened, I had an extra 30 minutes in the day. So because I just kept learning like, and it was, and it was never emergency until you were like, I'm blocking off this time. Then everything happens. So I literally would block it off. And then like maybe an extra 15 minutes or an extra 30 minutes, this is my oops time. And then also it, it took the pressure off of me because I'd be like, I spent this, I blocked this aside. And if I don't get it done, you know, then how am I going to get this stuff done? But also I need to be attentive to the volunteers because we can't ignore them because, and it just, it just was really like a war inside. So by me creating and giving that extra time, it also, I found that I had more patience to hear what the challenge was. I wasn't like, all right, go. You have like two minutes and 24 seconds and done, right? I now, because I knew that I had built in the time, I was, I had more patience to listen, which made me an effective, more effective listener, which helped me to more effectively solve the challenges because I wasn't so worried about what I wasn't getting done because I had built the time in for it. Um, and don't be afraid. Like one of the biggest things that I, that I um, did was, like I would carve out time and the, my, the one organization that I worked at, um, I had weekends off, but it was a 24 hour, like seven day a week thing, but, and I had weekends off. And so the, the people who I worked with, they, their days off were typically like Mondays and Tuesdays, um, or like Sunday, Monday or whatever, whatever it was. And, but for whatever reason, they would call me on Sunday for what, for something. And I would always answer. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Cause I'm like, surely if you're calling me, it's an emergency. And I would pick up the, and cause it was very important for me to have that away time for me to recharge so that I could come back and do what I needed to do. And I'd pick up the phone and it'd be like, Hey, you know, do you know where the extra pens were? And you know, I'm thinking they're like, oh, and Sally, we just had to send Sally to the hospital and, you know, like all of these things. And it was just like, really? so I, and the thing is everything that they could have possibly needed going into the weekend, I made sure I emailed, I gave copies. I was like, and if I'm not available, this is the person that you reach out and here's their contact information. And did it. like, I gave them everything they could possibly need. And then they would call me and ask about what was in the email. So, but there's two sides to that, right? Because I kept answering the phone. So by me answering the phone, it gave them permission to keep calling. So as every as much as it hurt me to not do it, I stopped answering the phone. The first couple of times they were just like, what's happening? Then guess what happened? They started reading the email. Then they just stopped calling. So when it got to that point that there was an actual emergency, then I knew that they were calling for a real emergency, not just because they didn't want to look at the email. So it's difficult, but you have to fight for your time. You have to fight for it. And that's why I say carving time out. You're not making time. You are carving it out and you have to stick to it because it will make everything else fall into place because now you can make plans to have a conversation about how to get buy-in. You can make plans about how you're going to educate. You can make plans about all of these other things, but if you don't have the time to do it, you've lost it. So incredibly um, important to hear that, I think, because probably a lot of people on the call can relate to feeling like I'm a, I'm really helpful. I want to be really helpful. And um, it's, you know, it's really challenging, but it allows you, I think, I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's actually allowing you to be more helpful because you can address some of these other really significant challenges um, by being able to make space to have that time for brainstorming, time for 
conversations with leadership and cross-departmental sort of initiatives. So it's feeling like, you know, if we can kind of start to recognize that maybe not all tasks are the most helpful task for like long-term term growth. And um, so let's dive in a little bit to, you know, when we can acknowledge the challenges <laughs> And really start to um, really manage them, I guess, you know, manage these challenges. Um, what are some of the benefits that can start to happen when we are carving out space to innovate for volunteerism within our organizations? Does anybody go? I don't know. I don't want to like take over the whole thing. Oh, no. No, it's fine. Yeah, I know it's hard to get here. We want to hear, uh, but yeah, I mean, no, there's, I think this huge tie in, right. You know, we had time that tied into so many of the other pieces, right. So are there benefits in your mind that really tie together um, in this? Because I, I see again, some common strings, you know, but whenever you can do something like have increased communication, you're also probably increasing your engagement, right? So these things go hand in hand. And as I saw a lot of things in the chat while we were going through. I'm just naturally <laughs> looking over there normally anyway. And I saw a lot of these like, um, it's really hard to keep it, but also this uh, challenge in recruitment. So how can some of those challenges become your benefit here and tie in back to that? Tying the, like the, the recruitment back into ben or some of the, like even the time into the recruitment. Yeah, for oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, as you fight for your time, it will can allow you to brainstorm or even, you know, look over the data that you've gotten. Because sometimes you get all this data, you don't even have time to look at it to see where are people coming from, what regions, what time of year. Like, is it more, do you get more people coming in or does it drop off when school starts back? Or depending on where you live, it goes up when school goes back. Like, who knows? But um, there's so many benefits to that. You can be collaborative and and like you said and as you're collaborative maybe that's that marketing message that can help you get the word out to help bring in people through the recruitment um and there's something that i believe in a whole heartedly is as you are doing a lot of these different things like a rising tide lifts all boats that was a jf kennedy quote right so as you're working and helping and collaborating and finding that time to do all these things, it benefits not just you, not just your impact, but everybody that you're working with, your coworkers, your colleagues, everybody benefits and the organization benefits and the impact is increased because of that as well. It feels like too, you know, when we think about the benefits of making space for innovation, Nicole, it feels like a lot of that is being able to set time aside for that bird's eye view um, and making space for innovation allows for programming and leadership and, and volunteer management to just notice things. Uh -huh. You're uh -huh. saying like noticing a trend or um, diving into your data when you haven't had a chance to do that. And, you know, because you're answering the phone. <laughs> so, and, and I, I have, been that person too, and still um, manage that urge for myself. But, you know, I, I think that it sounds like just the benefits happen when you get a chance to pause and notice, and then you can kind of start to make a little bit of space for these, these innovations. Mm -hmm. And one of like a really great benefit of the collaborative is that is you don't have to come up with the solutions all by yourself. You have a team of people, you know, ha get an advisory team. If you don't have an advisory team, you know, get good, get in good with your colleagues and, you know, say, I, there's something that I want to do here. Invite somebody from development, invite somebody from, from finance. Like, Hey, I wanted to brainstorm with you. These are some things that I'm thinking, get a bigger picture, get them invested. They'll be more willing to help and get involved if they feel like their input matters. And the best way to do that, find out what are the pain points in their everyday work, right? Cause we, I know I've been guilty of it. Nobody does. Nobody knows what I do all day. And people just think, you know, you could just order a volunteer and I'm going to take them out the refrigerator and just put them out of plate. You know, like that's just not how it works. But I had to stop and be like, you know what? But the same way that they don't know what I do, I don't know what they do either. 
So if I, one of the things I started doing was just like going to each department, like, hey, I just want to understand a little bit more about your job and how ours connect even in like um, a third or fourth generation way. But even though it may not seem like it, something that they're doing in marketing is directly affecting my volunteers on the floor. I want to understand that path. Now they understand and, and be genuine, right? Because now they understand that you actually care about what they are doing. You care about their opinion. You care about their input. And now it's become more collaborative. And it's just, it's a lot easier to maneuver things. And you don't have as many roadblocks and challenges as you've had before, because it's not just like, oh, me and mine, and we're trying to get this stuff done. And I don't care that, you know, the whole network went down, um, you know, in IT, but I need to get my volunteer stuff. You know, I mean, like, yeah, just thinking like that. Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of collaboration because when it can happen, it can be really exciting. And um, so let's talk a little bit more about how, you know, how could we what are some of this, these high level steps we could take to sort of help that along? I call it a framework for innovation, um, but you could call it a framework for collaboration. You know, it does feel like there is a lot of collaboration involved, as you just mentioned. So I think, um, I think like, I love this right here. And, um, and like, uh, court mentioned that uh, your guys, you're going to get all of these slides. So we're not going to like go through everything that's on there. Like you can read through it later, but just like the basics, right. Design for change, make sure that whatever that change is, does it align with organizational goals? Cause that's going to be your, that's going to be your, um, your, your, your magic, potion, you know, because if anybody says anything, you're like, oh, and you bring it and tie it back into the mission. Now they can't just dismiss it as easily. Um, engaging in strategic planning. I actually have a phenomenal um, podcast episode and some resources about strategic planning that I included that you all can, I mean, please listen to that because that is some phenomenal stuff. Um, establishing clear communication. If you are in volunteer engagement, you already know that. So I'm not even going to delve in on that. Um, seeking input and involvement. That just comes right back to what I was talking about, getting input from outside of your department. Um, and then focus on capacity building and resources. What are, what are things that you can do? Are you working hard or are you working smart? Um, I have a lot of stuff to say about that. Like in a really, like I've got, I got a lot. That could be like two podcasts and a webinar all in itself. Um, Pilot and evaluate, my absolute favorite, right? A lot of times people, like, if you want to try something, try, there's something about the word pilot when you're like, oh, it's just, it's a pilot program. It's something we want to try out. It just, it, it brings down barriers. People are like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I don't know what it is, but remember that word, you know, we just want to pilot this and see how it works out because then there's no risk, so to speak. And they're like, cool, try it. And you know, you can, it's a lot easier to slide it through when you call it a pilot program, right? Just trying, just trying some things out and then evaluate how it works. And if it works, great. You can implement it further. And if not, cool, but it didn't, you know, it didn't affect a whole organization or, or even all of your volunteers at the same time. And you were able to learn and get that data and move forward from it. Um, highlight benefits and success, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. One of the things that I had to do um, in one of my very first roles, because people were like volunteers, they don't do anything. They're this, they're that, da, 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 da. At our all staff meeting, I was like, hey, for all of you all who think that our volunteers aren't that valuable, last year, they brought in over a million dollar in-kind donation. They submit, they did this many hours. They changed the lives of these many kids. They, they stop. they, you know, they stuffed, this was back before it was too really digital, but they stuffed 5,000 envelopes like and putting it in terms of numbers that might be relevant to them. Um, then it was just like, oh, I didn't know our volunteers did all of that. So, hey, can we get some volunteers? I was like, so it worked a little bit better than I was expecting because then they wanted volunteers to do everything. But that was great because it's job security for me. So um, and then creating a, a supportive environment cult. I like that fostering um, the culture of innovation and addressing concerns of resistance. Do not shy away from the difficult conversations. Um, I have a podcast um, 
uh, episode about that. And we talk about, is it called a difficult conversation or a meaningful conversation? Difficult means it's hard to have that conversation. Meaningful means that by the time that conversation is over, you're going to have a solution and you're going to know which direction you're going because the conversation had meaning and it had purpose. So one of those things that I love, and I have to give the credit to Barry Altman, but that's what he would say. Like, is it a difficult conversation or a meaningful conversation? And even approaching it from a positive connotation as opposed to a negative connotation makes all the difference of how you even look at it. I really appreciate hearing that, Nicole, because I do feel like, you know, especially if we're trying to innovate, and sometimes that can mean that we're attempting to break a pattern. And that might take a few tries. And it might take revision on our part, it might take internal mindset, you know, and, and shifting on our part. And that, that could be an energy spend as just an individual person. But I really appreciate that because that word alone, um, just taking difficult out and replacing it with meaningful. I, I feel like that is going to be a really big takeaway for definitely me and hopefully for a lot of other folks on the call as well today. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, AK, I know that this is a, a huge part of what you're doing when you're talking with all of the um, the organizations in our network is really thinking about the whole program um, and, and how we can support that. Yes, you need the, the tools, but you also need a lot of other things as well. So let's dive into this kind of more holistic approach of um, volunteer programming, volunteer value at a nonprofit organization, which we hear, um, we hear a lot of discussion about that, the value of volunteerism. Absolutely. Yeah. And I um, actually heard a really valuable conversation a couple weeks ago as well um, around how your impact within the volunteer, your volunteer work is finding its way into the mission statement of your organization. So how is this weaving through things you're already naturally trying to do that can help kind of combat that resistance to change or these interdepartment conversations, leading it back to your mission? I think that's always such a good back plan is <laughs> like, how does this pull all the way back to what we do? And how do our volunteers, how are they a part of that? And by pulling together these resources, you're able to quantify your volunteers and speak to the their value in other language, but you're also being able to weave together a story, a story that of, of impact that does reflect what you do. And I think it's just such a powerful tool that is right there. It's just, it's hard to get your head around it for sure. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Nicole, it feels yeah, like it's you. Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, AK. No, go for it. <laughs> I was going to say, it feels like, day. too, just like <laughs> setting this framework for innovation, it does allow, you know, sort of to what you were speaking to, Nicole, it it, it, it does allow um, volunteerism to not be um, necessarily a separate department. So that's a little bit of what I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing is that a culture of innovation at your organization allows for um, more meaningful conversations, but also just a more integrated approach um, to viewing volunteerism. And so it's not just like, oh, it's that department over there doing those things, um, you know, and really thinking about the the whole picture. So anything that you you can share from your experience about sort of moving from that separate departments to this more, you know, integrated sort of uh, this model. 100%. So one of the beautiful things about what we do is we have the opportunity to touch every department in the building, unlike a lot of other departments. A lot, you know, some, some departments can be more siloed or like, you know, they will, they don't necessarily, but we have the opportunity to be a part of every, every department. So at one organization that I was in, we were helping everybody from the CEO to the production team, everybody in and everybody in between. So first of all, don't miss out on those opportunities to build those bridges because you have the opportunity to offer help and support. And if you come at it from help and support and helping people, nine times out of 10, they will reciprocate it. 
And then um, it just really starts to weave its way. I did a talk. <laughs> I did a talk literally about this thing. I put it in the resources. If you go and watch it, um, it talks about how after like I had to do that, that education, that education of the program, how after that, not only um, not only uh, were we able to help other departments, but when it came down to like our big annual event, people were jumping at the chomping at the bit to come and help to the point where like if they didn't get an invite, they're like, oh, man, I didn't get to go to the volunteer thing. And I'm like, really? you have to go to the volunteer thing. Um, so, but it was because we had started building those relationships and people were building relationships, not only necessarily with me, but they were getting invested in the volunteers that were helping and supporting them. So it became culturally an, an entire organizational thing to where people then all of a sudden started remembering the volunteers, but it took time. Um, I know a friend of mine, she was like, they would always be having volunteer meetings and I uh, uh, like meetings in general and the volunteer coordinator was never in there. She's like, well, you know what? They have a public calendar and they're like, we're having a meeting about this event. She just started showing up. She just started showing up and they would talk about stuff. And then she's like, oh yes, but don't forget in terms of the volunteers, this. And then the next meeting she would, it got to the point where they were like, oh, she was bringing such knowledge that then they started inviting her and making sure she was included in the meeting. But she didn't just sit back and be like, well, no one is inviting me. Okay, cool. Well, make yourself known, show up. Now, listen, don't like bust in on the CEO talking about, I'm here. Like, no, no, no. Like, make sure it's like a public meeting. Make sure, you know, understand your parameters. Like, don't go crazy with talking about Nicole thing. I just gonna show up. Like, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, look for those opportunities. Where can you make yourself presence known and just always just keep, hey, don't forget to volunteer, the volunteers, the volunteers, the volunteers, until people, it just be, starts to become ingrained and they realize themselves that the volunteers are part of the organization and 90% of what is done can benefit from having the volunteer help there. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of things jump out to me as I'm hearing you speak, you know, just that increased kind of quality of service delivery um, when the volunteers are viewed more holistically in value in the organization, because um, there's just something about people that feel appreciated holistically that love their job, you know, love their role, love what they're doing. And, um, and then it also feels too, like just a sense of community that's jumping out to me because then people are feeling more invested and engaged in all kinds of things that are happening. Um, and, also, it feels to me like sustainability of the organization, the programming, the services, um, the, the volunteerism, it feels like that all, you know, when we feel connected, when we feel bonded and we're, we're viewed more dynamically as individuals for our contributions versus just these are only the volunteer hours, right? We're viewed more dynamically we are more engaged. And I think that is like a huge part of, of volunteer engagement. So just in hearing you kind of share some of these stories, I'm, I'm feeling like certain things are, are popping out to me. And, and also just really thinking about how the organization is viewed in the community um, because volunteers are out there and they're in the community and they're talking. And word of mouth recruitment, you know, word of mouth engagement is huge. You know, when people have a positive experience, what's something that they do? They go on social media and they're like, had the best time today. And that's the that's free marketing you know, for your organization, for your programming, your services, what you're doing. And all you had to do was just view people in 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 this way that's a little more like holistic. So let's talk about something that's a little bit of a hot button topic. We've got hot takes going on here today, but um, this is a, a really important, I don't even know if it's a trend or if it's just something that, that has only recently started to become measured, but let's talk about this volunteer donorship. Tell us, tell us about it. <laughs> okay. Well, for me, I am very passionate about this, especially right now, given my situation. Um, so a lot of us already know, like volunteer management, um, volunteer leader, like that role, a lot of us experienced it in the pandemic. If you were a leader of volunteers during the pandemic, I think almost like 80% of my colleagues, I was one of the few that was saved, but I think it's because I tap danced for so many years before that. And I was like, I could be, I could bring value all over these places. And that's also that part of that integrating throughout. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, don't, 
don't like quote me on these numbers, but in my personal experience, almost about 80% were either fired um, or furloughed. They were either let go or furloughed. And that that's just a very, very scary position to be. And then, and then recently um, I was uh, laid off um, from an organization because of budget cuts. And it's just like, ah, I just like, how, how, what can I do? And this is where that creative solution, like this is where this happening because it's this trend that it, that always just keeps happening. So I'm like, what is it that I can do? How can, what can I bring to the table differently so that if our organization is struggling and they're going through something, I am not so easily cut. My position is just like, oh, it's not so cut because I had a friend who was like either a VP or a CEO of organizations. I don't remember which one it was. Don't tell him I don't didn't remember. Um, but he was high up. And I asked him, I was like, what are you all talking about in those meetings? Because we all as volunteer leaders are like, how do you cut the position that can help you help um, either build capacity and have support, like having volunteers out? Like it's such an integral part, you know, and I told him and I was like, man, you know, we had one organization where they brought in over a million dollars in in-kind donations. And he just sat and looked at me. He was like, Nicole, he's like, this might be hard for you to hear because you're close to it. And I know it's important to you. He was like, but in-kind donations don't keep the lights on. He was like, and when we are looking at what we need to do, we need tangible. And I was like, okay, I didn't like it. I didn't like hearing that, but I understood because guess what? If I came and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an in kind donation of fifty dollars, or I'm just gonna come give you hugs, but you need your light bill paid," it doesn't matter how many hugs I give you, your light's still going off, right? So I was like, "Well, what can I do?" And then so I started doing research, and it was like um, we kind of, we just started finding out, you know, eighty five percent of volunteers donate to the organization where they give their time. So I lead a minefield, a treasure chest, right? And so I was like, I have all of these people who can be either like one-time donor, recurrent donor, like small gift donors. They could become big donors. Many of us um, have had that have had that situation where you know Sally comes in every Wednesday at three o'clock and does her thing and leaves and. Nobody knew that she was like a $50,000 donor, right? Like that connection was never being made. And so I was like, okay, what if the value that I bring, I want to, I don't want to replace anything. So I'm still, I'm going to give the the stuff that's for, for the numbers people. I'll give you the hours that we donated. Um, I'll give you the number of volunteers that we have. For the feelings people, I will give you the, these are how we changed people's lives. This is the impact that we had. You know, more people had meals, more people had. The, and then I was like, but I want to go and add one more thing. This is also the amount of money that we brought into the organization through this channel, right? So I landed at, it's not if we do it, but it's definitely how, right? Um, cause I was also one of those people who was like, they're already giving their time. I'm not going to ask them for money until I saw this stat. And until I had volunteers coming up to me going, how come you all never ask us to donate? And I was like, wait, y'all want to do it. Um, but there's a way to do it. You also just don't go up and be like, yo, after your shift, can you like give us like 50 bucks? Like it's, it, it's not about that either. And it has to be genuine, but the fact and I don't know if you all have been in that position. I know I've been places where I volunteered. And when I saw the need, um, there was just something even more so about giving money to an organization that I believed in and then seeing the benefit of the donation I gave immediately. Like I know that it went to help this group of people or whoever I was helping, as opposed to, I just sent it off somewhere and I'm taking their word and hoping that they're doing it. No, I see it because I gave this and then look, it manifested and they got, so people are more encouraged to give when they see the, when they can actually see the result of it. So 
it was like, okay, so I started, um, and I had actually started working on this right before I got laid off. And after I got laid off and had that conversation with my friend, I was like, I a hundred percent now. Yes. I started having conversations with development. Like how do we, how do we, and we're not necessarily encouraging volunteers to give, but we are at least letting them know that they have the option, right? What, one of the campaigns that we did, I was like, Hey, you all, this is what I just want you all to know that these are different ways to give at the organization. I called it like an educational campaign. We educated our volunteers because just like Court said, if they're having a great adult, grand all time, they're telling their friends, they're telling their family. Maybe some of their friends and family come and can't come and volunteer. But if that conversation, well, you should come out, you should come out and volunteer with me at 545 in the morning. And they're like, girl, no, that's not gonna happen. But hey, you know, um, my job that says that they will match. Like if I find an organization to give to, they will match. Oh, well, yeah, that's available at our organization. Money coming in. Um, uh, if, again, you have people who, if they just love it, they also want to give. Um, they'll tell their corporate partners. They will tell other people. It's it's equipping them with the information. And then the residual is because they are aware and they're educated on all of it, they might actually do it themselves as well. But I'm not coming to you asking you to give in addition. I am educating you on all the different ways that you can give, all the different ways, um, depending on the organization that you are like, because one of the organizations I was in the arts. So our volunteers were um, interacting with patrons all the time. And it was common to, before a show starts, a volunteer would just be standing in the lobby, helping guests before the show started, having conversations with them. If they are equipped with that, that's advertising that they can share with that person to like, to bring funds in. Um, so I just, it is something that I'm very passionate about because I, like I said, I, I am at the point where I am tired of every time something's going down with the organization, they're like, oh, the first thing they're doing is they're cutting the volunteer program without even thinking about it. I want to make such an impact that, listen, if you're going to cut me, it's you at least have to think about it and it's going to hurt a little bit. I don't I, I don't want it to be just not even a non-issue, like, oh, it doesn't even matter, right? Because at the end of the day, unfortunately, money has to, like, if, if we can't keep the lights on and can't um, pay the water bill and, and don't have a building, it doesn't matter how great the volunteer program is. We don't have anywhere to go to volunteer. I mean, people don't have to go anywhere to go to volunteer and we don't have anybody to lead. So become a partner and a friend and a, you know, a relationship builder, um, a thought leader with somebody on your development team. Find out what their needs are. What are their pain points? How can our volunteers help you all raise money? So even if the volunteers aren't necessarily giving, they're helping to get. One of the things that we did, um, we had volunteers helping our development uh, department um, research uh, where to submit grants from, right? Because uh, they wanted to do all this, but they didn't have time to sit. So our volunteers would sit for hours. The, the, the development department gave them the parameters and they just sat on the internet for an hour researching all of the companies in the area who lined up with their values, who offer um, grants to the causes that we believed in, and then submitted the, 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 submitted the sheet back, development they were able to go in, apply. Some of them we got, some of them we didn't, but it was stuff that they didn't have time to do. So now if we're like, hey, we're cutting the volunteer, volunteer department development, it's like, wait a minute, hold up. They helped me bring $50,000 in. Can we think about that? Like, that's, that's where I am. That's where I'm at. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. But I, again, like I said, it's just because, you know, it's very real for me right now, but I also, I can't look at it in my own lens and feel badly about myself and be like, how come they just keep cutting this? Like I have to think bigger picture. It's not just about me. It's about the organization. And do I have an understanding of what the entire organization needs and how can I help? I want to enhance it. So not only in, in kind, not only in um all, like impact but how can i help impress dollars because unfortunately at the end of the day like money talks at the end of the day so i just 
I'm going to stop now because I feel like I'm rambling. I just got really passionate. I'm back. I forgot there was a whole audience. I'm like, wait, sorry. I'm back now, but I'm, I'm going to stop. <laughs> no, there's so many, so yeah. <laughs> there so many nuggets that I, I, I can see resonating with a lot of people. And I experienced something really quick that I wanted to share was I had um, started working with an organization local to here and they're looking for help with their fundraising department. And I was okay. Okay. Tell me more about how you work with your volunteers. And they go, Oh, they completely shut it down. Like, absolutely. We don't. And the big question there was why? So I would challenge if you are hitting a wall there is to ask why, you know, see if it is a rooted thing, for a, a leftover, <laughs> a leftover policy, yeah, but it also might be this piece where they're just not understanding what this can mean. Like exactly what you said of like, it doesn't have to be just straight out asking people after their shift with for money. <laughs> you know, there's so many other ways to go about um, how you're asking and how you're incorporating this and this holistic view. It's always coming back. And I, I love that this pilot and evaluate is on this slide as well. Just right. Because we're all like pocketing pilot that phrase. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so it's such a good idea. You know, even so if you do have this resistance, but let's just pilot. No big deal. You know, we can just pilot a giving program. We can pilot a strategy here and then taking those results because that can really speak to your leadership. Yep. You carve out time on the calendar, have that conversation. And then um, one of the things I am huge, if your organization does not have an advisory team, a volunteer advisory team, we need to talk because that's another thing. Um, and the reason why that's so important is because I feel like some of you all might be like, yes, but you know, we've had volunteers come up and be like, how dare you talk to me about money? And how dare you ask me? Which is true. You are going to have those people. So that's also another reason why you just put it out there. It's like, nobody said you have to, it's a suggestion. But also, we also know that there's something as the vocal minority. And just because one or two people say it does not mean that the other 98 are not behind it. So have bring it up as a discussion on the in the advisory um, meeting. How do you all feel about it? I was shocked. They were like, oh yeah, we'll do it. And this is, and these, and then guess what? They came up with brilliant ideas that I didn't even think about, right? And I invited uh, development in, development heard them, listened to them. So now they feel connected because they're talking to people inside the building who are making decisions. You're strategizing, putting all these things together. And now you have feedback, not just from one person who says no, or one person who's like, yes, you have you have many people to pull from, from, you know, and get the volunteer that might have only been here for three to six months. And the volunteer who's been here since, you know, before, and they, you're like their fifth volunteer manager. Cause you know, you have those that have been there for 20 years and getting that input and like, Hey, how would you feel? And make them feel a part of the conversation. And how would you go about doing it? Like, I just, I feel it's just something that need not be left on the table or ignored because it's way too important. If we are going to survive, as volunteer managers, when things get rough, we need to give them a reason to keep us as opposed to, well, you should just keep us because like, no, everybody else is grounded in numbers and grounded in how they are giving to the organization financially. Why not us? Because we're always the first one to get cut. So let's, I want to change that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, we had this really um, amazing chat yesterday on data. And sometimes it is simple as just solving your data issues because all of these activities might be happening, but they're not being tracked. So volunteers might be giving at incredibly high rates and nobody has identified the trend. Um, so there's just all kinds of things that might be really naturally occurring, um, but it is bringing that kind of those facts and that awareness. So you can have these conversations. I am so glad that you said that really, really quick. One of the organizations that I worked in, like within three months, I was like, cause they were like, we have a recruitment problem. I was like, no, you don't, you have a retention problem. No, 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 we have a recruitment problem. I was like, I promise you we don't. And I just kept saying it and saying it and saying it. And they were like, ah, okay. And then one day we did this report. I don't remember how or why we did it. And it was like, oh, wow. Look at all the people that came to the, and I was like, Yes, look at that. It literally, and I didn't mean this like in a in a sarcastic way. I was like, 
Yes, it's literally backing up what I've been saying for eight months. And that was when I found the power of data because I'm not a numbers person. I don't like numbers. I'm like, eh. but that day I became a fan of numbers because it put um, validity behind what I had been saying for months. But it wasn't until they saw the numbers that action changed almost overnight. So get that data. Yes. And because then it can show, hey, and that's one of the things that I did. I was like, in our first, in my first year that we finally started trying to track this, it was a little off, but hey, our our volunteers, the people who volunteer and give brought in almost $500,000. That's like half a million dollars. Who's going to be like, oh, we're going to get rid of them. No, no, let's rethink that. Let's rethink that. So, but the thing is I got laid off before I was able to have that conversation, but I was ready. I was ready. But I was too late. But that's okay. It's all a learning experience. So again, I'm sorry. I, I did it again. I'm, I'm just. No, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're sharing your advisory team course with um, oh, wonderful that as well. So thank you for that um, that bonus, you know, gift discount offering for our, our audience. Um, and I think, you know, what you were speaking to is really just being proactive in having conversations with leadership and being prepared with that data. Um, because it, it is like what you were talking about earlier is, you know, you have to know your audience. And if you're talking to the audience in your organization, like leadership, and they need to know about dollars and cents. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that other, there's not room for innovative proposals. It's almost like, I think you might've said this recently, but like check the box and then you can have a deeper conversation about more, like check the box of what it is they really want to hear and need to hear. <laughs> and then you can move on. Yeah. Uh, I know we have just a few minutes left, so I want to keep, keep going um, and make sure we get through here to the end. And we're going to share all of this with you, but um, I love the framework of being able to have that proactive conversation and knowing that it's going to, it's going to come up and that you can, you can build that relationship and that process together. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, a bit about what we're speaking to is that you can know both your numbers and your community and kind of hold, hold these realities at the same time. It's never either or one or the other. It's kind of all of these things happening at once. Um, and it feels like that is really, you know, the message of innovation is just that we're holding, we're holding a multitude of things, um, as we move forward. So um, here's a little something for, you know, what we were talking about earlier with, you know, how we can change our own mindset and how we can change that. Um, what was it difficult to meaningful? So here's a couple of other things to, to leave everyone with um, that we'll talk about to Nicole log off today. Yeah, yeah sure. Definitely um, developing a vision as a volunteer leader, like what, what is your why and what is the impact that you want to have. And what a good way to start with that is like, ask your supervisor, like, what are the expectations? And then build it back from that way and making it personal to you. Um, engage in opportunities for professional development. Continue to learn, 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 learn. Just like, you know, coming to these webinars. And I don't mean to just like plugging all my stuff, but there's like, um, I do like a book bites. Um, and that's like a book review of leadership books every month. There's things like that. It's um, better impact book bites. You can find that. But Everybody, there's so much out there, but just be intentional about learning something new every month or or at least every quarter, because if you're not growing, you're going to be stagnant, right? Um, grow your volunteer leadership community. Connect with people. If you are not a part of Adovia, if you're not a part of an association, find other people that you can talk to. Connect on people, connect with people on LinkedIn. Um, don't do this alone. You are not in it alone. I did not know that there were other volunteer manager leader people out there until I was like six years into the, to the, to the, um, into the profession. And then I was like, oh my gosh, people who get me when I say this, like you're not in it alone. You can be there. Find people to connect, um, with the type of work that you're doing. I was in the arts, um, I was in the arts. And so I've tried to find volunteer managers that were in um, the arts. And listen, if you're, if there's a community out there that you're a volunteer leader, let's say it's in like, you know, saving the alligators and you're not able to find somebody else who's saving alligators, start one. If you start it, people will find you and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I've been looking for you. So don't sit back and be like, oh, there's not one for me. Be the one who starts it and affect that change. Um, 
So just do all of these things, like just be proactive. Don't sit back and, and, and let life happen to you. Find ways to be proactive to move yourself forward. Definitely become a CVA. Oh yeah, I saw that on there. Become mm -hmm. a CVA. That will help. That's a whole network of people who have that same basic understanding. And I mean, there's just, just don't, don't do this alone. And everything, the biggest thing that I want to leave is everything that you're going to do is going to take time. So don't be like, oh, I'm going to do this and expect for it to happen tomorrow. It's going to take time. So be patient with yourself and make sure you know, choose one thing, choose one thing and work towards it. Don't think you have to choose six different things and work on it all at the same time. No, because we're all trying to figure it out. Choose one thing. And maybe this year, this is what we want to um, impact and grow next year. This is where we're going to focus on and impact and grow, but figure out what that is and that what's important to your organization that at this time or important to your program and then focus on that. And you can get a lot of that, having those conversations with the other departments and hearing what their pain points are can help you determine what is it that you want to start working on. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I love your passion for the profession. I think talking about these things, uh, you know, as a volunteer engagement professional, it's just, it makes it so exciting and dynamic. And it's like, I'm a, I'm a part of an exciting, you know, field. This is like a really cool profession to have. Look at all of the different ways you can grow. Look at all of the different ways you can affect change and become a dynamic leader at your organization. So to me, it's really, um, it, the enthusiasm, of course, we thank you for being here with your energy and appreciate that so much. Um, but also just like the, the, the dynamic nature of the profession. It's really exciting and engaging to think about all of the possibilities. Indeed. Indeed. And listen, if anybody wants to dive deeper or have just like have questions, I'm open. I'm also consulting as well. So I'm doing trainings. I'm doing all of these things. I just want to help people. I want to, I want to help people and help them, you know, dive deep. And if you, you know, need help along the way, that's what we're, that's why we're here. Connect to me on LinkedIn. And I think they put all my, all my stuff in the chat. And if not, it'll be in all the resources. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to send you everything and definitely want you to connect with Nicole on LinkedIn. Definitely want to um, keep having conversations with you. Please come to our July webinar with Brianna Dorellis. Um, I know Nicole included in um, her bonus resources, um, a really great podcast with her and Brianna. So this is going to be just a really great summer um, of talking about these important um, and dynamic challenges and exciting, innovative changes in volunteer leadership. We want to thank all of you for coming. Um, yes, Nicole's on LinkedIn. Find her there. Um, and thank you so much, Nicole. This has been just an amazing day <laughs> and a great process to get to hang out with you. Um, and please do reach out to us. Um, we are Get Connected by Galaxy Digital, and we represent a network of over 50,000 nonprofits. And um, actually, I think at this point, it might be two and a half million volunteers. So if you are looking for volunteer-focused technology solutions for your programming, your organization, we've got an entire family of products that meet the needs of any program size, organization, and budget. So definitely reach out to us. And we are going to email you Monday morning with the recording and all of the bonus resources. And again, just thank you for your time. Thank you, AK. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Nicole. It was my Everyone. pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you all for joining. Nicole, so good to see you. See you next time. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank you so much. I will make sure that I get the chat in there too for you. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. I'm going to log off and I will see you all later. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.